Okay, guys, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're live on Facebook. Um, so if you've just joined us, guys, on Facebook, we've been graced by the fabulous Rob and Stan. So Rob's going to tell us a little bit about his background, if that's okay, Rob, because you're new to the team. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for inviting me on tonight. Um, yeah, I guess um, I've been uh, I've been involved in the field of um, strength and conditioning and physical preparation now for nearly two decades. Um, I, uh, I I was an athlete. I started off as a as a pole vaulter and competed for um, for Great Britain on a couple of occasions. Um, probably wasn't quite good enough to make it as far as I wanted to go. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, academically, my, my degree was in uh, was in sports science, and then I, I sort of moved initially into working in the commercial and corporate fitness. But uh, then I moved more into you know, obviously into sports performance, strength and conditioning, and um, yeah, probably probably one of the big highlights of my career was. For six years, I was the uh, physical preparation national league national coach for for England athletics, delivering uh, um, coaching services to athletes and coaches during the 2012 and 2016 Olympics. Well, that's fantastic! But uh, oh, not not just athletics. You know, a lot, a lot of I spent quite a few sports, um, uh, professional squash, uh, even horse riders. So, so quite quite a wide range of, of sports. That's fantastic. We'll probably touch on a couple of other sports then, if that's okay, just to get a little bit of a background. No I know for, for Stan's background is mainly running, so um, it'd be good to talk about the runners and that component as well. But I'd love to hear about some of the F and C and how how um, specific we need to make it for each of the individual sports and what kind of things um, people should watch out for with some of the common sports that people take care in. But um, Stan, you've worked with athletes on the track for a long time, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, Steve, uh, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's from that involvement that um, you know I was able to meet Rob on many of our surgeons with uh, both athletes and coaches, uh, all in an effort to you know make a contribution to help athletes achieve their train both their training and the competition goals, and of course my focus there would be much from the neuromechanics relative to you know um, speed skills and running technique you know so so that yeah that will be my focus you know in you know in all this yeah fantastic great so um we've had a couple of discussions about s and c uh for runners but um it's a very interesting subject because a lot of people t are taking up running, especially now in the COVID crisis. People are at home, they're donning the running shoes and they're going out and running as part of that. Um, it's a great thing for business because without the S&C component, people will end up injured. Um, and as much as we don't like that to happen, it's a great thing for business. So if you want to go and um, empty your bank account and put it in my bank account, continue doing that. But I think it's very important to listen to what Rob's got to say tonight about S and C, and um, with all the goodwill in the world, it's really important to make sure you have a um, a very varied approach to running. So rather than just going out and doing like pound in the pavement and running, S and C is so important because, in all seriousness, it does stop you having to go and see um, osteos and physios to pick up the pieces when things do fall apart. And we also get to see much more interesting things than telling people you need to go and do more strengthening. Because um, it gets a bit boring after a while. We want to be seeing some really interesting things. We actually want to be helping you with the performance because that's where um, I think osteopaths and physios can really make a big difference working alongside people like um, Rob. We are just touching base, weren't we, before about one of the athletes that we've worked on uh, before. But that that's a very um, – it seems like a very common sense thing for the S&C coach to be working with the, the track coach as well as the physio and the osteopath. But – um, do you find that's a, a new concept with regards to how people work together in everyday physiotherapy? Because I know in, in England, athletics are a very different setup, but in mainstream kind of public physio, do you think that's a new concept? I th yeah, I think it's fairly new. Um, I mean, even, even in, you know, even in national governing bodies that have, uh, you know, have significant amount of, uh, of funding. I mean, when I was in England athletics, you know, during during the 2012 Olympic cycle, that was a uh, that was a 22 22 million pounds worth of funding, and and even during that time, with some of the you know lead S and C coaches, the collaboration between the S and C coach, the physiotherapist, the technical coach, let's say the sprints or the endurance coach in this case, um, was you know was challenging at times, um, and you know 
one thing that that, that you know is I found in, in you know said in athletics for nearly twenty years, uh, and even other sports is particularly with the endurance community and, and runners. Sometimes you know the the endurance coach will very much say, okay, so you know you've you've sustained a knee injury. I want you to go to the physiotherapist, or I want you to go to the osteopath. Um, come back and see me when you're better, and and you know, and then we'll start training again without actually being part of that collaborative process. And I think it's really important that you know that the go back to what we said earlier, you know, particularly with the medical practitioners and the strength and conditioning coach, whether that be a physio or an osteo or a chiropractor, um, that you know there is that level of communication, and you know, because re- rehab. Rehab is a continuum, and as you said uh, earlier on, Stephen, rightly so. Um, injuries will be, uh, and they are. I'm seeing it. Injuries will be off the scale because people, you know, they've they've decided to go running without being physically prepared and conditioned to, you know, to run. Um, as you said, then therefore people are finding their way onto the onto the treatment table. Yeah. But I, I, I think it's I think it's changing. Um, uh, yeah, the in a in a nutshell. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I guess there's no time that's more important than having that collaborative element than when it comes to young athletes coming into performance. So one of our questions tonight was for you, Rob, in particular, and also Stan. It'd be great to hear your input. But um, what what and why are there concerns for S and C for young and some adult runners? So what kind of problems do you see with S and C? Um, introducing it for young young runners and, and adult runners is that for is that for me is that rob um yeah that's a that's that's a really good question um i think if i you know obviously with the youth athlete and that you know and, and 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 the young runner um if we you know if we look at the term strength Often that often that's synonymous with just lifting weights. Yeah. Um, but of course, it's much broader than that. So you know, you, you could you you'll give a real example. Yeah, you know, I could have uh, a, you know an eleven year old um, young youth youth athlete that decides that you know they want to they want to start getting involved in in endurance running. Um, we really do need to it, it in a nice as possible way expose them to a diversity of stimulus and and what i mean by that is you know they need to learn to squat they need to learn to lunge you know they need to learn to hinge the hips they need to get their trunk or their or people might refer to it as the core or not you know strong oh Anyway, would be sufficient in order for them to get, you know, some increase in strength. Um, and importantly, I, I would I would turn this around a little bit, and I, and I would say that strength training or, or resistance training um, is coordination training with resistance. Being able to coordinate those movements with a resistance, whether that be body weight, whether that be a band, a dumbbell, you know, a power bag, a barbell. So. You know, the concerns, uh, I'm not sure what they're born out of, if, I, if I'm honest, because there's a really limited amount of research, if any, to show that young athletes or youth athletes engaging in strength training will get injured. Because I've never seen any in, you know, 20 years of doing this. And if somebody can find it, let me have it. Do you, do you think it's think, where yeah. um, young athletes go into the gym and they don't have supervision that there's there's a temptation yeah. for them to try and copy some of the other stuff that's going on and that maybe is where that that um, yeah. concern has kind of crept into the yeah. the public eye. I, I think so. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to answer that, Stan, or do you want me to answer that? Yeah, I think it, it's uh, the concerns there really. Uh, I think in my mind they come from a position of lack of awareness. They are concerns really to do with health and safety. They are concerns to do with health in so far as if the young people are going through that growth spurt that in the adolescence, it really what are the implications to their growth and their growth, you know, right, if they start 
adding resistance training to it. So there are concerns that emanate from, you know, wanting to know and lack of clarity, if you like, about, you know, the impact or rather the, the benefits to strength and conditioning. So in some cases, it's easier for parents and young athletes to possibly leave it well alone, leave SNC alone, because I'm not too sure about you know how to go about it and what the benefits are and so the fear factor is greater than the knowledge of the benefits i think that's where the concerns are yes what, and like it has already been alluded to it's the lack of guidance it's the lack of a program a designed program of strength and conditioning that is what the problem could be but where there is a guided and well-developed training programs and supervision any athlete beginner or what of whatever age are able you know to undertake and you know uh, uh, and also receive the benefits because the benefits are there the benefits are there through research and through you know you know uh, the pragmatic sources the benefits of smc are all there to see So where, where do you think uh, a young athlete should start when they're trying to get into the into the gym role? Um, I, I think what's what's crucial, obviously, you know, initially is you know, do a, li a little needs analysis, obviously, of you know where the where the athlete is, um, you know, in terms of you know we 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 hear now a lot about you know functional movement functional movement screening. Certainly, if you yeah. look at the work of, of, of a guy called Gray Cook, who's uh, who's an American physical therapist, obviously we would say physiotherapist in, in, in the UK. Um, you know, look at look at look at how they move. So something as simple as, you know, an overhead squat or a lunge or something like that to see where there might be some kind of movement dysfunction. It's probably, you know, it's not so easy for this forum obviously to go through practical uh, you know practical demonstrations. Um, but you know leading on from that, once you've got an idea of how well the athlete moves and more importantly you know how frequently they can, they can train, and probably more over how what facilities they've got access to. I I would very much start with what we would call primal movement patterns. Now yeah. that very much is looking at a squat pattern, a lunge pattern, um, a push, a pull, a rotation, and a brace. And the reason I the reason I pick them again that comes back to some of the work of uh, of, of Gray Cook, um, but also a guy that was in the uh, the fitness industry for many years. Um, uh, his name escapes me, but it will come back to me. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially, if you look at those movement patterns, whether they be on bilateral, whether they be on two legs or unilateral, whether they're on one leg, they're movements that occur in that sporting action. So, you know, if we're looking at running in its purest in its purest sense, we need to be able to obviously, you know, land and absorb three to five times our body weight, possibly more than that. Um, uh, you know, and effectively, as we, every time we land, we're going through a single leg squat. You know, we're going through an extension of the hip and the knee and of the ankle in, the, in that order. So, therefore, the athlete should start with something like a double leg and then a single leg squat but move on to more explosive exercises uh, in, in terms of, you know, jumping. Uh, uh, you know, when, when often people say to me, you know, isn't, isn't plyometrics dangerous? Could it not cause an injury? Well, every time we run, every time we sprint, every time we strike the ground, you know, it's a plyometric action. So it's really important to teach the young athlete. You know, I said the young athlete, the question was around adults as well. The adult beginner runner, it's really important to teach them those movements before they increase load yeah no really really interesting um so it's something that stands touched on before with that um the accommodation phase of the pre preparation so um that kind of leads us quite nicely on to the next question but what do you think the main benefits are of physical preparation for a running program um obviously there's the obvious things with regards to the tissues becoming more adaptive and responsive to the load so that, that's really important but uh, I'd love to get your opinion on that and also to get some insight for those people at home, but also to learn a little bit more about some other things that you feel are, are, are benefits of that physical preparation with regards to the S&C elements of their running program. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, 
I, I think, you know, if again, if we if we look at, you know, the, the biomechanics or the or the movement of running, you know, you've 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 got to be able to receive about three to five times your body weight each, each time you, you you know you, you stride the ground. So, you know, the, the advantage of, of, of a physical preparation program is it teaches you maybe a good definition of physical preparation is achieving the physical qualities in order to perform the technical action. So those physical qualities being, you know, strength or force production, being able to absorb force, you know, what we call force force reduction. Um, you touched on it earlier, you know, in terms of, you know, mobility, flexibility, acceleration, de- deceleration. So if we, if we, for example, you kind of, it's, really, it's really easy to, to, to maybe talk about this. Let's suggest somebody goes in the gym and they do a, you know, they do a back squat where obviously we're placing a barbell, uh, you know, on, on the back. I'm not saying we're going really heavy at first. And let's say they're doing four sets of six repetitions at about, you know, 60% of their maximum. Um, obviously, as you said earlier on, Stephen, you know, we we recruit motor units or we, we improve the, the health of the tissues. We, you know, improve the ability to, to, to produce force. And in doing that, we can then apply that to the ground. So the most important thing is, which everybody talks about, is the efficiency and the economy of running. So again, it's nice to use examples. If we use Mo Farah as an example, if you want to see efficiency and economy of running, you have about the best there is, obviously, you know, and, you know, stands to reason with the times that he ran and, and obviously the speed at which he, which, which he ran, uh, which he performed. Um, so, you know, also what, what I'd like, what I often say, and this is very, very true in the medical world, is it's robustness to injury under fatigue. Yeah. Where we often see injury and, you know, and, and, and you know, particularly with runners where they sustain, you know, a back injury or a patella tendon issue, injury or a, or a, or an Achilles tendon injury. Um, they haven't got the robustness. So running, Stan and I were talking about this a couple of days ago, running doesn't make you strong. A lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm running on the streets. I must be making my legs strong. You're running on the streets to improve your exercise physiology or your, or your aerobic capacity. So we, effectively, we need to get strong to be able to perform that action efficiently and not break down. No, it's very, very interesting. I've got, I've got a question for you on that as well. Um, but Stan, do you have any more any more input on that with regards to physical preparation? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from a neuro standpoint is that uh, the biggest benefit that an athlete or anyone engaged in running or a form of physical activity where the motion is involved is the development of the neural pathways and the synchronization, you know, of motor units. Now, I think that's, for me, that stands out because that becomes the, the basis upon which all other movement patterns you know, are designed, designed based from the demands of a particular sport, the demands of a particular movement, or the demands of a particular challenge of motion. So if if an athlete, a young athlete and a beginner athlete, you know, take time to focus on those fundamentals, it only enhances the, the progression and the acceleration of their skills within the running you know, with their, within their running participation or competition. So that's where, for me, strength and conditioning and the physical preparation is really key. I think sometimes athletes and beginner runners tend to start the other, you know, the flip side of it, just go out there and run and hope, you know, everything will just fix itself from the act of running. Yeah, sometimes it does do that. But the body is a body, it's a system of systems. And if only we can tuck into the systems and improve the systems, we would get a whole lot much better, a lot quicker. And the learning process of that motion is also accelerated. And muscle memory is enhanced, you know, a 10,000 fold. Because we have gone in with the right patterns and, uh, and induced the right adaptations, 
for the right, you know, for the, you know, to beat the right ch the challenges that are set before before a particular run. So that's the importance of physical preparation for me to set out the base upon which all other and the future uh, demands, be it or from a volume standpoint or from intensity standpoint, the foundation is set because the body has been physically prepared to meet them. Yeah, no, very good. Very good point, and thanks very much. Um, so, Rob, I've got a question for you. Um, when because I used to play tennis when I was younger, and one of the things that we used to do, we we're quite naive back then. So, what we the, we just know the fact that we perhaps a tire pulling and all that kind of stuff to help improve our kind of zero to five meter sprint time, uh, which is all that you need for tennis, really, because you're not going to run more than five meter sprints. Um, but one of the things we used to do for the longer distances was actually to load our ankles and wear weighted uh, vests. What are your views on that now in terms of the, using that to specifically load for running? I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting concept. I mean, you know, the, the, the use of weighted jackets, you know, I, it's, not, it's not so prevalent within, within the endurance community. It's not, certainly not, you know, within the UK from, from, from what I've seen. Um, I had spent some time in, in, over in California and I'd seen some, some endurance athletes training with weighted vests then. I, I think the key thing really is you would only, you would only want to do it for a very short period of time because the danger, certainly if you're looking at running, the danger is by, by create, okay, yes, by, by putting the weighted jacket, jacket on, clearly we're, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're placing more of a challenge. It's a progressive overload, and and obviously over time we're going to get you know an adaptation. The problem arises is that unless it's on, and as Dan mentioned earlier, unless it's on a solid foundation of some really good running mechanics, yeah. my concern with the weighted jacket, and, and it comes back to what Stan said earlier on about motor unit recruitment and synchronization. The danger is is that you don't get the neuromuscular you know coordination at a high enough firing level, what we often refer to as rate coding, so if we're looking at sprinting, because of the jacket. So, you know, going back to your, you know, into tennis, and I've spent quite a bit of time with tennis players, you know, and Andy Murray did certainly, you know, you might use it for some short, as you said, five meter sprints, some agility, some change of direction. But the key thing is it's got to be a contrast. So, in, you know, in doing maybe two, three sets with the jacket on, you do one or two sets afterwards without the jacket on, um, so, you know, if you took running in its simplest form, if somebody's never been exposed to strength training and they just, you know, run in long, slow distance in a, in, a, in a straight line, if you make them do five 40 meter hill sprints, that will be a form of resistance training to them because of having to generate more force to get up the hill. And obviously that's like lean of the trunk. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to then add a weighted jacket to that. Yeah. The problem is the movement would just become too slow. Um, uh, to give a real example, I'm, you know, I, I, I look after a, the strength and conditioning of a, a, a young lady. She, she was 27. She ran 2.55 in her first London marathon. She came from a good 10K background. She ran 10K for England. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I wouldn't, with her, I wouldn't go anywhere near using, uh, you know, a, a weighted jacket for anything. Um, she, she would just break down and she it would the problem is it would take too long to recover and it would impact the rest of her running sessions yeah no it's very interesting, no, it's very interesting. You, you mentioned hill sprints they have a, a long platform and have you been there recently uh, i have been there yes so they have a long platform what's your views on acceleration training for um, for sprinters in particular, so getting them used to reaching the high velocity by running down a slope rather than. Because I know we talk about hill sprints and running up the slope, but there's this. What are your views on the side behind getting them used to accelerating down slopes? Um, it's a, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll give my my own view on it because I also coach as a you know as a speed and a, as well as an SNC coach. I, I coach a lot of pole vaulters, long jumpers, and triple jumpers. So I spend a lot and rugby players. So I spend a lot of time teaching you know maximum velocity um, or, or, or top speed. Um, I think I think it would be crucial to ensure that the athlete knows how to accelerate well first of all, and also has a solid technical efficiency at high speed running so you know as long as 
they can they've got a good foot strike you know they've got good dorsiflexion they've got good stiffness through their ankle you know they've got in, you know in, in in our language we'll often talk about stiffness through the tendons being able to store elastic energy and keep a really brace solid trunk i think if they had that foundation and they had no pre-existing injuries such as knees and backs uh downhill i might use it for a short period of time i mean mm. I, I looked at some i looked at some research on this over the over the years and I, you know, i'm always obviously trying to keep up with their evidence-based practice i i've now ne- i've not seen that much that suggests that you know downhill running is superior to uh you, you know doing just good good sprint good sprint mechanics i think the i think the thing that i mean the thing i use for many years and and uh, when i when I trained as an athlete um, yeah, and traveled to a few training camps uh, across the world, we used a lot of overspeed bungees. So we used bungees that would pull us. In a, now, the key thing there was, because we were still on on flat ground, on an athletic track, on flat grass, the foot strike was still in the same position. I think once you add the downhill element, um, you know, it's 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 different. The, the final thing I'll say on this, which is, is interesting, um, you, you might you, people the viewers might remember you, you guys will remember um sergei bubka the the ukrainian um you know soviet uh, pole vaulter you know who'd you know uh, sort of broken world record over 20 times yeah, six meters 14 i think he did um i went to a training camp in italy in formia and they had a downhill run up there and i said to the coach um uh, what do you and, and do you use the downhill he said i'll take you to it and he took me to it and it was a mass of weeds and trees around it and everything else. He said, this is what we do with it. We don't use it. And, and it was, <laughs> that was, that was, it was an interesting insight into, they didn't use down for run up. Yeah, they had one. Yeah. No, it's very Maybe that's it. so, <laughs> what are your views on um, like sled pulls, sled pushes and parachutes and the, the bullets? Have you come across the, you must've come across the bullet. Explain the bullet. Explain, explain what you mean. The bullet's fascinating. If you if you ever get a chance to try the bullet, it's just the weirdest feeling. So basically, you have a there's no tension in it. That your right. coat is behind you to stop you running. So there's some resistance, and then he says three, two, one, and then he lets go, and it. I know. He lets so yes, yeah. From a, so he'll yeah. run through you, and then he'll let you accelerate very quickly. But what what are your thoughts on yeah. those? Um, for I mean, for a specific uh, training within running. Because I know. Uh, going into the gym, people will argue that, well, it's not running specific. So then they'll say, I think that's where all yeah. these other things have kind of come from, isn't it? Trying to make it very specific but, and running. Of course. I think, you know, if you look at, you know, if you look at, if you look at athletics in particular, uh, you know, if you look at track and field and, you know, particularly, you know, rugby, those, those strength speed sports, then, you know, band resisted or, or, or sled toes in, in various forms, um, you know, a pretty, a pretty prevalent. Now, I guess the key thing is when you're looking at that acceleration phase, we're looking for, we're looking to produce much more horizontal force. Yeah. So certainly, you know, during, when we're accelerating, certainly over those first seven strides, we're looking to produce much more horizontal force. So horizontal to vertical is probably seven to one. Um, you know, so it, it's a very good way at teaching us to, 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 to drive back with it, you know, with a body lean. So I, I will use quite a few sled toes with, um, with rugby players, not just front row rugby players, but I'll also teach the back line players, you know, the wingers and the centers, uh, you know, how to, how to accelerate better. But then as you said earlier, you know, we'll then do the contrast where they then get rid of the resistance and, and, you know, go into an extra sprint where the, the, the turnover or the cadence is, is, is increased. Um, the, the parachutes are interesting. Um, I've used them. Uh, I use them for a very short period of time, and that was it. Um, I don't see that there's any any added value. It, it, they're, they're pretty. Uh, be careful what I say. They're pretty fashionable in the states, um, and you know the, the problem with the parachute is, and it depends on the conditions, because the parachute is going from one side to the other. It, it's 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 having it's having an effect on on adversely changing the running mechanics. Yeah. You know, there was an argument for a while that, you know, core stability might be improved. But actually, we know that the research around core stability improving performance is fairly sketchy. You know, so it's not said you shouldn't do it, but you shouldn't be doing something like a parachute toe in order to improve stability around the trunk. Yeah, no, very interesting. Very interesting. Thanks for that. Um, 
Stan, have you got any more views on, on that in terms of physical preparation for running? Yeah, my, my contribution on that, you know, it's both for, you know, for both. Either it's assisted running or resisted running. Because that's what these, these gadgets and all these aids, training aids are all about. Either you are being assisted and the, the thinking there really is to be looking at, you know, stride frequency to try and um, get the athlete or whoever it is, the you know, the, the practitioner to, to enter a different threshold within their leg, you know, with their stride frequency. Have them feel how it is, you know, to be able to travel at a different cadence. But for me, the problem with that is in so much as there are probably any benefits, you know, plus, minus, whatever benefits those are, it comes at the cost or the likely cost of compromised running mechanics. Because in much as you are trying to gain on the numbers of stride frequency, what is the cost on the mechanics itself? Because things start changing all of a sudden or the body's response to traveling at a faster rate than it is in control of the natural instinct there is to start applying breaking, breaking forces. The body just assumes that position from a safety point of view. It assumes that position to protect itself. And so, yeah, they're having their cadence, they're having the leg frequency probably higher than they've ever experienced. But guess what? We are already conditioning the body to poor running mechanics. The body can't select, the body can't choose that this is what you want to do. It will simply go along with what is the safest way to achieve, to accomplish a movement task. So unless there is a really a quantification, you know, a calibration that there's a certain percentage of assisted running that is required, that can be applied. And that's a tall order. Everything else is really assumed. Much of it is really assumed. So. In as much as yes, they add to the whole pool of athletic development, their benefits really are a bit sketchy out there. They give us a good feeling that we are working hard, but in terms of efficiency and the proficient outcomes, we probably are not gaining as much as we think we are. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Um, so as everyone knows that watches this, um, we always try and leave the show with um, the the guests, uh, three top tips on how to improve this subject area. So we're going to come on to that section, but we've got one last question for Rob before we move on to that. So um, Rob, what methods do you use to progress people through a, a physical preparation program for running? What, what kind of things? We've talked about parachutes and sleds and what would be your ideal way of progressing someone from like beginner um, or a more elite runner? So how would they differ? Would you introduce uh, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, I think the parachute, the sleds, you know, as we sort of probably said now, that's kind of the, you know, the icing on the cake, as it were. There are so many more things that the app, that, that the runner could do. So if you, you know, so if you're taking, if you're taking the beginner runner, you know, what, what are going to be those key methods? Well, sounds obvious, but really importantly, warm up well, because, yeah. you know, a, a really progressive warm up, it forms part it could be a physical preparation session so you know what what would i use with you know the the let's call it the weekend warrior recreational runner that sticks their trainers on you know he's running you know wants to get fit maybe wants to reduce some body fat you know wants to feel good brilliant you know i i, I would say you know within the warm-up make sure you go through some mobility stuff you know um yeah it's probably a whole other discussion around the use of foam rollers in terms of you know myofascial release to free the, to free the tissues. It's going to be one good form of physical preparation. Um, but as I said earlier on, you know, really key exercises, um, you know, squats, uh, step ups, or what we call Russian step ups. Russian step ups are quite specific, where we step onto a box and we drive the opposite knee. So it's very very similar to a running action, um, but it but it's very good at training that posterior chain, and particularly training through the hamstrings and the you know and and and, and the gluteals. Um, what what a lot of people are gonna maybe want to hear me say is you know circuit training. You know circuit training is perceived to be 
sometimes you know the the, the magic as it were and you know if you look at circuit training and you know somebody doing something for 45 seconds as an example as i thought stan was saying can you produce quality movement and movement excellence if you're doing something for 45 you know to 60 seconds and the question you know i often put to people is you know how do you feel at the end of it uh, do you feel really fatigued do you feel really tired and have we just got tired or actually you know have we have we got better and that's the i think that's the key thing to ask um just sort of uh, uh, one key crucial method and i sort of like, i put a lot of this on my you know i post a lot of this sort of on you know instagram and and, and facebook is using medicine balls and, and when i say using medicine balls i mean throwing medicine balls in order to develop that triple extension develop that neuromuscular coordination as, as, as stan said earlier you know and and effectively organizing the limb so if i throw a medicine ball vertically above my head what i've got there is i've got a squat pan i've got a jump pan i'm working my trunk i'm landing and i'm really having to generate some some force explosively which is no different than when we strike the ground to extend the you know the hip and the knee and the ankle so it is very much a training training the adaptation if that makes sense not training the exercise per se so you've got to think about what's the adaptation we need in order to improve performance at whatever level that is yeah that's fantastic thank you for that um rob do you have is there do you feel like there's much specific consideration from the the higher center adaptation to exercise i know there's a there's a tendency for people maybe it's just my naivety in it but there seems to be a huge tendency for people to think about the muscular unit um but they tend not to describe the neuromotor control of that or the higher center element so things like um like fear fear of falling for example with uh yeah. athletes, sprinters um i used to come across that quite a bit in terms of like there's one athlete in particular she she, she wouldn't let herself fall forward. So her start was literally her coming out of the block, standing up straight, and standing then up. Up. so it's very yeah. interesting. Um, but that, that's one particular non, uh, non-muscular non component. Um, yeah. A non-muscular component would be the, the rate of adaptation and the learning response, which is purely neuromuscular, not just muscular. So well, it's probably not got, not got very much to do with the muscle per se. It's more the the wiring that's going to the muscle and the higher function. So do you, do you put much importance on those when you're looking at these early phases? I know Stan's really big on that, but what, what are your views on that? I, I, th- I think it's absolutely, absolutely crucial. You know, as you said, there's, there's a lot of talk sometimes about, you know, what's, what's happening, as you said, at a motor unit, at a, at a, at a muscular level, you know, obviously there's a level of coordination within that. But I, I, I think, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, there's been a lot of research around, you know, learning skills and what happens within, you know, within the motor cortex and what happens within, you know, within, within the spinal cord. So I, I, I think that in any any kind of skill learning, it's really important that we we might, it's often referred to as, you know, creating a motor engram and in, and in creating, a, you know, a good motor engram to, 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 or movement pattern. To do that well probably takes around three to 500 repetitions but about three to 500 reps, some of the research suggests three to 500 reps, but of really good deliberate practice. Yeah. So going through that excellent practice. And this is why I came back to earlier on to when I talked about, you know, circuit training. Yeah. The, you know, we're training the muscles, we're training the, the system. We're getting fatigued. We're getting tired. We feel like we've worked out. We feel like we've worked hard, but actually have we got any better? And what is that signaling like, you know, obviously, to 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 the brain and to the spinal cord and then back to the you know to the working uh, working musculature um so i i i think that this is this is why if you if you took a if you take sort of you know jumping or plyometrics as a as a training modality for you know for runners that's absolutely crucial because there again it's really important around you know around signaling but also it's around the tendon development you know rather than the muscular development and we know that with running if we can use our tendons more and be more elastic we're going to be more efficient uh, and we won't accrue fatigue so quickly does that sort of answer the question or not yeah it's brilliant it's brilliant i think there's there's different i think one of the things that um 
Maybe, maybe it's just the way that they they're probably thinking it, but they don't do a very good a good job of explaining it sometimes. And or maybe I'm just not listening well enough. But I hear hear a lot about muscular adaptation. Um, there's just almost there's this missing bit when the patients come in. They haven't really understood why they need to practice and why it needs to be deliberate, like you mentioned, um, and why it needs to you need to focus on it and concentrate on it, but do it for short periods of time rather than the circuit yeah. training for long periods of time, which is not going to get the same no. response. Yeah, exactly. Right. The system, but not so good. For and I guess there we're sorry. I, I guess there we're talking, you know, particularly a lot more around. I guess proprioception. Yeah. You know, and sensing where that kept sensing where that joint is in space, you know, and I, and I you know, I, I do use some, you know, instable environment training, you know, getting people, sometimes I get runners to, you know, stand on top of a boasted board, stand on a dome, and then I throw a medicine ball or a tennis ball or, a, you know, basketball back and forth at them just to try and, you know, really improve that proprioception, but then bring that back to a, you know, to a solid base, which is obviously where their, you know, where their training environment is. I guess if somebody, you know, was, you know, particularly if they're running at speed and they've torn a hamstring, yeah, it's not just about getting getting strong and improving mass, muscle mass. Yeah. I've seen this a lot of professional rugby players. They come back, they get bigger in a sense, you know, more hypertrophy, and they come back three games in, they tear their hamstring again because they've not learned, as Stan said, the skill of, of running at high speed and that neuromuscular coordination. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there, there's some... There's some fascinating points, both for and against instability training. I see a lot of people on LinkedIn in particular, it tends to get absolutely criticised when you when you see an athlete training on a BOSU ball. And, um, but I think it's contextual, isn't it? And I think yes. what, it, what it potentially does is not just a... I think those are the people that are just thinking about it from a muscular point of view. I think there's a there's the, the other people that are thinking about the more higher centre function for me, it's all about training awareness and adaptability to forces rather than just training that neuromuscular unit. Um, yes. I think it goes yeah. way beyond that because I think when you've got people that are training in that um, unstable environment, I, I know the research probably isn't there to support it, but it makes sense that you're making them much more cognitively aware of their environment, which must have an input back onto their, their proprioception system, which I think is very difficult I, I, in a research paper, but would be interesting to measure. Um, it, it, you know, and, and this is this is always the challenge. You know, sometimes we can be, uh, you know, and I say this, I, I do quite a few lectures to to um, to master's degree students. You know, and they'll say to me, you know, where's where's the research and all this? Yeah. And of course, yes, you want to be, you want your methods to be backed up by research, but. Quite frankly, sometimes you know there is you know there is anecdotal evidence. You know, there's well, one lad I won't mention his name, but one lad I'm, I you know, I worked with who made the semi final in the Rio Olympics as a 400 meter hurdler. You know, we use some BOSU board stuff and, and some instability stuff, occasionally a little bit of Swiss ball stuff. And, and this this was this was post an Achilles problem. I mean, obviously everything was around his tendon loading, and you know, we work quite I work closely with the medical team. Um, you know, he, he recovered and, you know, he did that. And I, and I said, I just said to him, you know, what did you think to this training? And he said, you know what, I enjoyed it. And it made me think. So yeah. in actual fact, at that point, I say, really, I don't care what the research paper says. Yeah. He enjoyed it. He recovered. He rehabilitated. He made the Olympic semi-final. And that's just one, uh, that's just one case. But I've seen that with, you know, multiple athletes that, it, as you said, is contextual. Contextual. If, if it's part of the broader program, it's not the magic answer to everything but if it's part of the broader program then i think it has a place for a period of time yeah no i love that it's really good thanks very much so stan do you have any input on the um i know you did use lots of neuromechanics and and hurdles and uh, like low low volume plyometric drills in your early adaptive phase but um what are your thoughts on unstable surfaces and training athletes on them yeah um i think what we could, you know, bring on board as well in 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 understanding that is that um, the ground reaction forces are also they play a part within the learning process, the body's learning process of or in the development of movement patterns. Now, the ground reaction forces uh, that means anything else irregardless of what the nature of the surface so an undulating surface would have produced ground reaction forces that will have an impact within the learning process of motion 
either either as a positive thing or as a negative thing, either to accelerate or to decelerate, to you know to change direction or whatever. It will contribute to components of movement such as agility because of the unevenness of the you know of, of, of the terrain. It will contribute to other subtle mechanisms of motion such as proprioception you know and because um, if they're not there if it's all a flat and smooth surface guess what the conditioning is limited to the stimulus that is produced on that surface alone any other surface change this efficient and this powerful looking athlete change the environment and give them a different landing surface and all of a sudden they don't have the literacy within their neuromusculature to handle a surface that is undulating or a surface that is not even because those components have not been developed as it were in as much as they've had a perfect training surface medium it has also compromised on them learning other elements of motion that would come from an undulating surface so that's where my contribution would be regarding that Yes, it's an important part. It plays a part in there's a part in which where it sits. If the question is where do you place it, when must you introduce it? Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, thanks very much, guys. It's that time of the evening again. Um, Rob, I hope you've been thinking. Um, what would you what would you say your top three tips are? Things we've talked about tonight that used to be like like the the general public at home need to be doing right now with their strength training to help them with their running? What would you say the top three tips are? So I, I, I think the first one would be, and that's, this sort of sounds very obvious, is, you know, is to get, is to get stronger and, and move well. And in, and, in, and in that, I mean, learn how to move well and go back to those exercises. You know, things like a single leg squat, things, things, things like a lunge or a Romanian deadlift and, a, you know, a Russian step up. Go through those running specific type exercises to improve the specific strength for obviously for running. I, I think the I think probably my my my, my second tip um, would would be um, is often the case with runners is is develop develop appropriate flexibility. Now, what I mean by that is you're not trying to be as flexible as a gymnast. You know, you don't need to go get into this into the splits, but make sure after you know. A, a, a steady longer run when as you said earlier when you're pounding the streets make sure you develop flexibility after the session no and, and that doesn't mean stretching for 10 seconds that means holding the stretch for up to about 60 seconds in order to improve flexibility so you can improve movement if that makes sense but you're only going to improve move you're only going to use your flexibility if you're stronger and you move better if, if, if that makes sense and and interesting the question is how do you improve what, what are the three top tips to improve your running technique and to improve your running technique i'd run less mileage and that and that probably you know that probably goes against the ethos of running but if you're trying to improve your running technique in order to reduce the chance of injury run less miles whilst trying you know so focus on the technical aspects of running with you know running with high hips so a really key cue might be run with high hips and imagine there's a helium balloon on top of your head that balloon is pulling you tall to so focus on the technical aspects and run less mileage whilst you're trying to improve your technique yeah that's a fantastic point fantastic point i think that would that also reduces your injuries because you're not going to go out and be running as much but your performance is going to increase as well and i think um uh, stan you mentioned uh, uh, tina asked a question a couple of weeks ago and she she sent me a message and said that was the best advice she's ever had because what you told us to do is to go from 10k to 3k and then gradually build up rather than her thinking oh, i'm gonna run 10k i need to run 10k and she's kept getting injury after injury so she found that invaluable advice so that's i think that's a bit of a, a gold piece of advice there from Rob and Stan as well. So, um, Stan, what would you say your top three tips are for tonight in terms of runners improving their, their running from strength and conditioning? Yeah, yeah. Um, funny, but I would say my first top tip is involve, get involved and include, rather, 
strength and conditioning as a part of your running, you know, conditioning, as part of your running training. Because I think most athletes and runners come to it as, as a reaction to injuries. And then that's when they start thinking about SMC as an intervention. It, I'm saying tip number one, make it part of your training, i.e. let there be a proper SNC program running alongside your running program, whatever distance that it is. Because one, if it is planned for, then it is also periodized along with all the various components, the distance, whether the volume or intensities that you are doing. Include it as a deliberate plan. That's the first thing that I would suggest. The next tip there is just like you learn technique for running, learn the techniques necessary for strength and conditioning because these are movement patterns. Therefore, upskill yourself in those, in those exercises uh, because that is, you know, that, that is important. And lastly would be, basically uh, the last one would be be consistent with it. Learn, learn, and learn some more. Because it's only through learning that you get better at the first, at the first two tips that I've shared. Fantastic. Some great advice. And Terry just wanted to make a comment. So he said it's an excellent point with regards to research, Rob. So thanks very much for that. Um, he said not everything's the most important thing is that as to enjoy and runner's experience. It's important as well. So I think that's a really good comment from Terry. Thanks very much for getting involved, Terry. But yeah, if you want to uh, run quicker, run smarter, run longer, enjoy it more, then that's been fantastic advice from Rob and Stan. If you want to improve your performance, increase that a little bit and see what happens. But I think the key thing for me is to stop getting injured um, and stop yeah. coming to see me. I love seeing you people. Um, but it's, I'd love to be seeing you and helping you run faster rather than patching you up. So uh, let's get you guys running faster and I can help you with that instead. Um, so I'd love to be able to help you with that. Not that I'm bored or anything, but come on, guys. Do your best and see. Go on the gym. Or on the track and load yourself. So it's good. Great. It's been great yeah. speaking to you guys. Thank you so much for sticking around, Rob. Thank you very much. And as always, Sarah, man, you've been an absolute superstar. Thank you very much for your time and involvement. And for you guys at Facebook, on Facebook, We'll see you all later. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye for me, yeah?